Presently, there came crowding upon his mind all of the pressing problems that he must meet, the problems of the day, what to do about the millions out of work, those in need. None knew better than he the plight of those who stood patiently in the bread lines, dull with discouragement, with hardly enough spirit left to walk the treadmill of their misery. None comprehended more clearly than he that the time had come for action to relieve the necessities of men and women whose only desire was to get the work that did not exist. While he rested, got ready to retire from the governorship, his keen mind was at work on the problem of all these unfortunates, driven to idleness, precarious peddlers, and to accepting the charity of people in the street. Times were becoming more and more troublesome. There was agitation on every side. Prohibition agents were raiding liquor selling places and destroying illegal beer. New York's great population was aroused. And the symbol of that feeling was a great beer parade in New York City. Marched all day and far into the night, 150,000 people in line. Some folks were saying that the Statue of Liberty needed a glass of beer to cheer her up. She certainly doesn't look her old self in this picture. But tonight, and perhaps a little inside information of what was to take place on April 7, 1933, gave her a more agreeable aspect. The big girl down the bay was gazing, one must suppose, at that gay beer parade which was still swinging along on the electric lights of Manhattan. Communists became violent toward the close of the year 1931. Taking advantage of the depression of general unemployment, the Reds organized numerous demonstrations. They swept down from all parts of the city of New York to the city hall. In order to keep the communists from invading the city hall and upsetting the peace and order of the whole city, it was necessary for the police to deal vigorously with them. Never pleasant to see men clubbed and roughed about, however misguided they may be, but all appeals and persuasions were wasted. In case of use, the club or surrender to the riot. I am George Nye, the Quaker evangelist of Madison, Wisconsin. The great people of the United States of America are out exhibiting their menagerie. The Republican Party has paraded the elephant around the ring and fed him so much booze that already his stomach is contracting and he's about to lie down with a bellyache. The Democrat Party has paraded the jackass around the ring and fed him so much booze that he's liable to lie down in a drunken stupor. The Prohibition Party have always fed the boat on pure green grass and cold water. And now my slogan is uh, fire, fire, fire. I smell smoke, get on the water wagon, hitch the hose to the goat. And so, with firm grasp, he seized the helm of the drifting ship of state and took command in the darkest hour the nation had known for generations. A real American with three centuries of inspiring family tradition in brain and blood. President Roosevelt can trace his love for the soil and rural life to his first ancestor, Claus Martens and Van Roosevelt, and to 1649. That was a memorable year when the family came over from Holland and settled in New Amsterdam. Our president's branch of the family later moved up the Hudson to Dutchess County in the year 1818. And there the president first saw the light of day on January 30th, 1882. The home of his boyhood with its comfortable frame colonial house 500-acre farm is little changed from the days when he was a babe in his mother's arms. Sarah Delano Roosevelt is the president's mother, a lovely and gracious lady whose old American family were merchants and whose fast clipper ships raced to and from China in the romantic tea trade of the 60s.
In the old Dutch Bible, she recorded the birth of her son, Franklin. And one wonders if she ever dreamed that the baby of three months she held in her arms would someday place his hand on that same old Bible and take the oath as President of the United States. It may well have been, for Sarah Delano Roosevelt may have had in happy motherhood the strange vision that sometimes descends upon the mothers of only sons, an instant's glimpse behind the veil of the future. And we have a word for it, that Franklin was an active and ambitious youngster who invariably assumed the leadership of his playmates in their boyhood sports. Even at nine, there is visible in his face the poise and confidence that goes with leadership. Brought up and educated in sane, simple, and thrifty ways, our president passed from boyhood into youth and entered the second cycle of his career. At 18, well grounded by private tutors, he was ready for university training and entered Harvard and paid his first respects to the man who founded this great university, John Harvard. He became editor of the College Daily, the famous Harvard Crimson, writing with a vigorous hand and putting pep into the once staid and conservative sheet. Franklin Roosevelt left his impress at Harvard. He was a good mixer, a member of many social clubs, played football and was a member of the varsity rowing squad. Many a time he tugged to the sweep on the beautiful and historic Charles River, scene of the great annual boating duels between Harvard and Yale, and cheered with the crowds on observation train and shore as the Crimson of Fair Harvard and the blue of old Yale battled it out in one of their historic regattas. Childhood, the president has loved the water. At Harvard in those boat racing days, he began to acquire his wonderful naval library. There was a thrill of combat in those races on the Charles, which was dear to the heart of a real Roosevelt, a fighting Roosevelt. And even today, men who went to Harvard with Franklin Roosevelt recall his charming personality, his vigor and enthusiasm, his ability to get things done. He was a vital figure in all Harvard activities. Here we see him with his senior class group, and the time was close at hand to bid farewell to Fair Harbor. Out of college, he turned to the law for a career and entered the law school at Columbia University. And while absorbing Blackstone within these walls, he married Eleanor Roosevelt, his distant cousin, and a niece of President Theodore Roosevelt. As a young lawyer, he began his career in a time of change and tumult. The economic and social ideas of the country were changing rapidly. One of the seething movements of the period was the demand for the vote by women and the stirring campaigns of the suffragettes. In 1912, Franklin D. Roosevelt made himself a national figure by his support of Woodrow Wilson. Under Wilson's dynamic leadership, the country staged one of the most dramatic fights for the presidency in all its history. The great Teddy Roosevelt, leading his bull moose revolt against the Republican old guard, was delivering blazing speeches. He rolled up more than four million votes for himself, but Wilson won easily, supported by such enthusiastic lieutenants as young Franklin Roosevelt. William Howard Taft, defeated in the three-cornered race, maintained the famous Taft smile and took his defeat like the good soldier of the state that he was. On that historic 4th of March, 1913, 200,000 people attended the great ceremony at the Capitol, which was fated to begin a new era of tremendous consequences to America. And Franklin Roosevelt, among the guests of honor on the inaugural stand as the new Assistant Secretary of the Navy, felt his heart stirred by Woodrow Wilson's demand for the new freedom and took up his work in the spirit of devotion to his country. 1914, what volumes of drama and tragedy lie in those two words. War bursting over Europe. Civilized nations gone mad. The brave green host of the German Kaiser pouring through Belgium.
America is stirred anxiously, uneasily. Throughout the nation, demand for preparedness was raised. In all the great cities, thousands marched in preparedness parades. City, vast crowds jammed the sidewalks as 140,000 people, 12 abreast, swept up the avenue with bands blaring patriotic airs and the stars and stripes waving proudly in the sunshine. Democratic candidate was off to tour the country and to establish a record of speech-making energy and endurance never matched by any presidential candidate. At a great meeting in Topeka, Kansas, many thousands of farmers greeted his appearance and listened intently to his message of the New Deal for farmers as he addressed himself to those problems which are of outstanding importance to that section renowned for its far-flung acres of wheat and corn. Off again, 60 miles an hour to keep the right scheduled appearances to disappoint no city or section. The Northwest indicated how the political winds were blowing, when a vast and enthusiastic crowd welcomed him to Seattle, the metropolis of Washington State. The people showed an eager desire to get near this friendly man who seemed to understand them and who talked their language. The politicians said there'd been no such outpouring to greet a Democratic candidate since the days of the great commoner, William Jennings Bryan. And they recall that Bryan had been defeated three times. Having made a profound impression on his Northwest audiences, Roosevelt headed again for the East. One of his greatest meetings was in Chicago. Mayor Anton Cermak presided at a dinner in the governor's honor. And little could either know that only a few months would elapse when a brain-twisted fanatic would fail in an attempt to assassinate a president, but would fire the bullet which cost brave Cermak his life. Campaign labors were sometimes lightened by a ball game. And thousands got an extra thrill for their money when Governor Roosevelt himself threw out the ball to start the game going. And to add to the general festivities, the greatest showman who ever stepped up to the plate, the actor who never disappoints, the one and only Babe Ruth, crashed out a Ruthian drive clear over the right field fence, much to the governor's delight. Always he must heed the admonition, do not disappoint the crowd. You must be at so-and-so at such-and-such a time. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And so we find Governor Roosevelt already sensing the elation of coming triumph as he feels the pulse of the people entering Springfield, Illinois. again. Speed, speed, speed. Atlanta on his southern tour gave him a marvelous greeting, for Georgia is his second home and he has spent many months there in recent years. Tonight marks the end of a perfect day. In fact, I might say truthfully, two perfect days. The great warmth of your welcome 
has reinforced the obvious fact that insofar as carrying on a campaign in Georgia to get votes, my visit to this state has not been exactly necessary. And way down south in Georgia, he had some grateful hours in his winter home in Warm Springs. In the warm, magnolia-scented air, he gathered new strength to carry him on through the drooling campaign. Some real country fiddlers entertain him, while up north, Al Smith is making the Welkin Ring in Newark, New Jersey. What do you like to hear? I'd like to have you play Soldier's Joy. Yeah. 